All right, well, it's two o'clock, so we'll get started. Um, this session is Accessibility in Library Instruction and Programming, and our presenter today is Garrison Libby, who is the Assistant Director for Research and Instructional Services at Central Piedmont Community College in Charlotte. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Garrison. All right. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, seeing some yeses. Um, awesome. So if anyone you can't hear me, um, please just flag down um, chat and um, we'll try to fix everything. But otherwise, um, hello everyone and thank you all so much for joining this afternoon. Um, again, my name is Garrison Libby and I'm at Central Piedmont Community College in Charlotte, North Carolina. And just want to spend some time this afternoon talking to y'all about accessibility in library instruction and library programming. So just a brief um, kind of introduction and positionality statement about myself. Um, so I am an able-bodied librarian, but I am very interested in accessibility. I think it's a very important topic and it's just critical for us as librarians. Um, my background is primarily in academic libraries and academic library instruction. Uh, I do hope that this presentation will be um, useful for people who do any kind of presentations in any variety of context. Um, my specific experience and my specific background is in academic libraries and community colleges specifically and instruction. Um, accessibility is a very important topic to me, um, but it is also an area where I am continuing to grow and learn myself. So at the end of this session, there will be time for questions. Uh, I will certainly answer them as best I can, but um, I, you know, there could perhaps be things where I might have to um, do some further research on my own and get back to you. Um, so with that said, just to provide a brief outline of what we are going to cover today. Um, we are going to start with just some general tips on accessibility um, when it comes to presentation and instruction. Um, we'll talk about specific tips for doing presentations in person and considerations for your library space when it comes to doing any kind of um, class or program. Um, we'll talk about tips for presenting online, ensuring that your online presentations are accessible. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about PowerPoint and other tools and building accessibility into them. And then we will conclude by talking about um, universal design and centering um, accessibility in your instructional design, in your presentation design. And then we will conclude with time at the end um, for some questions. Um, if at any point during the session, if something's unclear or I just need to restate something I've said, um, again, just um, type a message in the chat. Um, Devin will be um, kindly kind of moderating the chat and can jump in if something um, needs clarification. But um, there will definitely be time at the end as well for. Um, question and answer. So um, just to get started, um, if you can just give me a sense of um, what kind of presentations do you typically do in your library? Are you an academic librarian doing instruction? Do you do programs or public library? Do you have students one-on-one? -on -one? Um, sorts of um, presentations and stuff in your library. And you can just type in the chat. Um, all right, uh, lots of things coming in here, um, all of the above. Um, academic one shot, um, so programming. Um, so it looks like a pretty good mix of, of um, stuff. Um, so that's really great. And again, I really hope that no matter your context, um, the this session and these tips will be um, will be relevant to you. 
So getting started with some, just some very general tips. Um, you really want to try to plan for accessibility um, when you are starting to plan some kind of presentation, instructional session, program, what have you. Um, the good thing about accessibility is that it's not, it's not very challenging, it's not super hard, um, but you do want to make sure you are building accessibility in from the outset rather than making the whole thing and then bolting on accessibility features after the fact. So when it comes to planning, be intentional in your design um, and um, just try to plan to build it in as you go along. I would also very strongly encourage you to familiarize yourself with accessibility tools, um, particularly if there are tools that are installed on computers in your library that are available to patrons in your library. Um, take some time to play around with them, uh, understand how they work and what it's like to actually use those tools. That will help you for one, uh, have a better understanding of the specific tools and technologies, uh, which can be great, but it'll also better allow you to assist patrons if they encounter challenges using those tools along the way. So take the time to try them out, play with a screen reader, know how it works and what that experience is like. Um, when doing any kind of presentation, you always want to be very clear and very specific when you are providing directions. So in my contact, context as an academic library, instruction librarian, uh, I'm often showing students how to um, navigate the, li the library website, access databases, and um, you know, instead of saying, okay, we're gonna click here, click here, click here, you want to be very clear and say, okay, on the library website, we're gonna to look to the right-hand side of the page and click where it says articles. And on the articles page, we're gonna click where it says ProQuest. Um, being very clear in where you're pointing um, your participants to will help make the session much more understandable and flow better and help them follow along with what you're doing versus if you just say click here and hope they can see where your mouse cursor happens to be. So be very clear and specific when providing directions to navigating the website, navigating resources or tools, and even the sign up page, just be clear in terms of what you're asking and what will be expected of, um, of participants. Also encourage you to reach out to uh, any disability services, access services staff in your organization, um, whether it's at your college, within your local government. Um, if there are um, folks who specialize in um, disability services, um, it's worth reaching out to them, maybe asking them to come to a staff meeting and learning a bit more about what they do, about the types of support that they can provide, uh, and just learning a little bit more about, um, <coughs> about accessibility and what that is. <coughs> so take some time and, um, you know, if you haven't met the folks at your institution or an organization or the local government, do that. Um, take some time to, um, to reach out to them. So next up, just another quick question for y'all. Um, how do you prepare or what do you do to prepare for any potential accessibility needs before you do a session or a class or a program? What kinds of things do you do? So for example, do you ask instructors before a class if um, participants have a, any accommodation needs? Do you ask participants when they sign up if they have any accommodations? Um, once again, if you still want to type in the chat um, what sort of things you do. Sorry. 
So a few different responses here, uh, the field and the instruction request form, asking if there are accommodations, really great. Um, Print out a few copy of the presentation with detailed notes, that's excellent. Oh dear, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, I'm trying to scroll. Um, asking the instructor, um, asking to sign up. Um, so those are all really great options. And so from the outset, from the preparation stage, when people are signing up, um, it can be helpful to try to anticipate potential needs. So ask the instructor, ask participants what they need. And that way, as you build the session, you can really have those things in mind. And again, be building in accessibility from the outset. Oops, nope, going the wrong way again. Okay, here we go. So when it comes to presenting in person, um, just some general tips. Um, first and foremost, like the number one important thing to do is to speak clearly. I know that seems very basic, very straightforward, but speaking clearly is something that is so critical. I'm someone who, when I get nervous, and I get nervous all the time, basically, um, I tend to speak very quickly. My words start to jumble together. And so I have to do a lot of work, a lot of preparation and rehearsal um, before a session to try to make sure I know what I'm going to say and work through saying it slowly, making sure that I enunciate my words um, so that participants can really understand what I'm saying. So if you're someone who also, you know, gets nervous or just feel like you have challenges public speaking, um, it can be very tough, but try to take the time to practice what you're gonna say, rehearse, um, rehearse by yourself, um, ask colleagues to be a kind of a test audience to help you feel comfortable um, knowing what you're going to say and just taking the time to make sure that your thoughts are organized and that your words flow very clearly. Um, another simple but very important thing is to make sure that you are facing the audience as you speak. I am someone who likes to write on the whiteboard a lot when I'm doing a session. I'll scribble down notes, I'll scribble down keywords for searching, I'll write out some directions. And I realized one of my habits is that I would often have my back turned writing on the board and I would still be speaking. But when I do that, um, that makes it that much harder um, for people to understand what I'm saying, just because of how sound travels. When your back is turned, it can be more challenging to understand the speaker uh, but also you can't read lips uh, if your back is turned. So if you are someone who like writes on the whiteboard a lot or is typing on a computer a lot, um, make sure that you are you know, taking the time to write and don't speak while you're writing. But then once you're done writing, then continue what you're saying. Or if you have to duck behind a computer monitor to type something, do that and then kind of come back and make sure you are facing the audience and you're making eye contact and your mouth and the movements of your lip are visible to your participants. It's also very helpful to try to provide multiple options for participation. Um, don't just ask people to um, speak responses to a question or a prompt out loud. But if you can, try to use tools that also allow people to provide feedback um, electronically. Um, because some people, um, they take longer to um, gather their thoughts and to respond. They may be more reluctant or less able to speak up out loud, but they can more easily type a response into um, a tool like Padlet, a tool like, a tool like Pull Everywhere, a tool like Mentimeter. All of these are ways to uh, allow audience to give um, feedback, to answer questions, to respond to polls and engage with the session without having to um, 
having to speak up and can give more, more participants an opportunity to engage with questions that you ask or um, questions that, or um, any discussion prompts you might um, prompt. Um, so build in multiple options for participation. Um, I do recognize that you can't always guarantee that um, participants will have access to technology. They may not always have a computer available to use like a tool like Pull Everywhere. They may not have a smartphone, um, but you can also do this with basic pen and paper where you um, just have people write responses on a sheet of paper. You collect that and kind of look through the responses or even a very quick like think, pair, share activity where you give participants an, a moment or two to think of their response, have them work in pairs or small groups to um, discuss their responses. And then the moment where they can collectively share out their responses with one another. So you can do this kind of in a low tech way as well. Um, if participants don't always have um, technology to respond to online polls or online discussion problems like that. And if you're doing a longer session, make sure that you build in time for breaks. You know, if you're doing a two hour session, um, try to at the halfway mark, build in just 10 minutes, five minutes, even if you have to, um, for people to have a break. Uh, a chance to absorb information, a chance to stand up and stretch, a chance to use the restroom. Um, build in those breaks. Um, I would say you know, a good rule of thumb, uh, there's no hard and fast rule, but for every hour, try to build in a 10 minute break session if you can. Um, when you're planning a session, try to plan it so you have a good break at the midway point. Or if you're not sure how long certain, um, certain parts will take, um, you can also just build in multiple break points throughout the session so that whenever you kind of hit like an hour mark or just um, kind of a time when it might make sense, you can just, okay, let's take a break, use the restroom if you need to, take a stretch if you need to, or just take a moment to, um, to absorb the information. So try to build in those breaks that gives to give folks an opportunity to reset and prepare for the next part of whatever it is you're presenting. Also want to take an opportunity to talk about considerations with the space um, that you use to present. Now, I recognize that we don't always have a lot of options to tweak how our spaces are set up. Um, our tables and desks and chairs may be literally bolted to the floor or just challenging to move because of where outlets are, how things are plugged in. So we don't always have um, full availability to tweak the space, but it is worth thinking about some of these things to make sure that your space is accessible to everyone. So one of the most important considerations is to ensure that the content that you are sharing is visible from everywhere in the room. Here at Central Piedmont Community College, we are very fortunate to have um, a lovely new library building that opened up um, last year. And some beautiful classrooms that are designed with flexible furniture that can be moved around, um, mobile chairs, mobile tables that, that can be configured in different ways. Um, that's really great, but as we were trying to kind of figure out a default room setup, one of the things that we really had to think about is setting up those tables and chairs in a way that no matter where a student is sitting, they can still see content that I'm displaying from the computer. Um, so that meant arranging tables and chairs and that they were always had a sight line to a monitor. And we're fortunate that we have kind of several monitors throughout the room. So that did give many opportunities for sight lines. However, um, our monitors on, in that room are not very large. So in addition to um, the sight lines, 
you also want to make sure that text is going to be readable and legible. So oftentimes when we're presenting in that room, we just want to make sure that we zoom in, that we magnify the text size to make sure that no matter where a student is sitting, they can see the content. So if you haven't looked at your presentation spaces carefully, um, I would recommend like go, go sit at different spots in that room. Um, sit at that one table, that one chair, that kind of a weird angle, and make sure that no matter where you're sitting in that room, you have a good sight line to content you're displaying to the speaker, and um, also that the text size will be large enough um, for anyone to read what's on the screen. If you have a larger space, especially, um, try to make sure there is a microphone available for the presenter. Uh, don't, don't just assume that you will speak loudly enough, everyone can hear you, um, because not everyone has the same hearing ability. Um, sometimes room acoustics are just kind of wonky. So if there is a microphone, make sure that you use it. So that way that everyone can very clearly hear what you're saying. If you're doing a session that allows for a lot of participants to speak, to ask questions, um, try to have a microphone available for them if you can. Um, but if not, if someone asks a question and they don't have a microphone, um, be sure to restate the question um, before you answer. Because when someone asks a question, they might not speak loudly enough, not everyone in the room can hear it, but then if you can restate the question before you provide the answer, all of the participants in the audience will be able to have the full context for what was asked and therefore be able to understand um, your answer better. So have a microphone available, um, try to make sure that it's charged in advance of the session, or if it's just a battery, it can double A battery power, that you have plenty of spare batteries available just in the case that um, it, the batteries go out in the middle of the session and make use of, um, make use of that microphone. Also want to make sure that at least some of the seats in the, in the room have, are near outlets or have outlets easily available, um, just in case um, participant requires their own technology, their own additional assistive tools in order to participate. Because um, some people do have to bring their own devices, have specialized tools or software equipped, um, and you want to make sure that they can use it. Um, so try to have space in your outlets, but the reverse of that is you also want to be careful uh, and don't have the room set up where there are cords and cables going all over the place. Because you also want to make sure that your space is um, easy, easy for anyone to navigate um, if they have a mobility issue or if they use mobility aids. Um, you don't want to have a lot of cords that are available that are tripping hazards. Um, you really want people to be able to navigate the room and easily take a seat. So, you know, it's kind of, it can be a little bit challenging. You want to make sure there are outlets available and there are spaces where people can sit and they can plug things in. But you want to make sure that even as you have that set up, try to also set up so that you don't have to walk over a bunch of cords to get to that seating either. So if you are able, uh, take a look at your, at your spaces where you present, where you teach, and try to think about some of these things are outlets available? Is there space? Uh, is there a microphone? Do I need a microphone in this space? And can I, um, can I see, can participants see content from wherever they're sitting? Shifting gears a little bit, um, next up, I wanna spend some time focusing on online content. So I would love to know um, from y'all, um, what kind of online content, online presentations do you do at your library? Do you do live synchronous sessions? Do you create embedded content for the website? Um, do you do a lot of recorded videos? 
Uh, what does online instruction and online programming look like at your institution? And again, just feel free to use the chat to um, respond. It looks like a lot of folks are saying all of the above. Some are just saying how to videos, uh, Zoom, LibGuides content. Yeah, and I definitely think like including LibGuides or where you're an embedded instructor in a learning management system like Canvas or Moodle, that's also online content as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, I think you know, all of us, we're all, we have to wear many hats, we can work with different tools. Um, so I do want to provide tips for um, doing online live sessions, and then we'll dive into some tips with specific tools. Um, so first up, um, just some general tips for presenting online, um, particularly with um, live synchronous session, kind of like what we're doing right now. Um, the same way that speaking clearly is the most important thing about um, making sure your in-person presentations are accessible. Um, speaking clearly is perhaps even more important and even more critical when you're doing an online session. Um, when presenting over a service like Zoom, uh, connection issues can happen. Um, sometimes there's audio issues, microphones, maybe they're not catching things correctly. Speakers, maybe the volume gets kind of a little bit wonky. Um, so you really want to make sure you are speaking clearly and being mindful of those audio connection issues, um, trying to take pauses to make sure everyone's understanding um, as you go along. Um, one of the great things about um, tools like Zoom is that they do tend to have support for automated captioning. So make sure you turn that on so that it is a tool that's gonna to be available for anyone who might need it. Of course, automated captioning is not always perfect, um, especially when you start going into different games for like databases, um, it might not properly transcribe what EBSCO is. So ideally you want to have um, PowerPoint to reinforce what you're saying. Um, and also maybe provide some clarification on terms. But in general, um, having automated caption will help give people an opportunity to understand what you're saying, especially if they start having audio issues, if there are some connection issues, they can still follow along on, on some level. Also strongly encourage you, if you're able, to have a partner um, in a session with you who can share links and reiterate information via text. I know that with staffing, uh, that's not always possible, but when you can, it can be very helpful to have a partner who can help moderate the chat, but then also as you walk through certain things, they might be able to share those links, but also um, just very briefly reiterate information about what you're saying. So if I'm doing a live session and I'm trying to help my audience get to ProQuest on the live, live website, I might say, okay, we're gonna head to the library website, we're gonna select fine articles, we're gonna look down this page for where it says ProQuest, and we're gonna select that. Um, having a partner who can then very briefly in chat, just very briefly reiterate those same steps and then provide the link that I'm getting them to, can help participants follow along and also make sure that they have the link to get where I'm trying to get them to go. Now, you don't want your partner to be restating every single thing they're saying. Um, you don't want them overwhelming the chat with constant text reiterations um, because then people's attention can get split and get hard to follow along. But at key points during the session to help remind people the steps that we're taking and the links we're getting to can be a very helpful way to get, um, to help people follow along. And then like with uh, online, or like with in-person presentations, 
you want to make sure that you provide multiple modes of participation. Um, again, um, there are tools like um, Padlet, Pull Everywhere, Mentimeter. Um, here in Zoom, we have uh, chat functionality. Oftentimes there's built-in polling or question answer functionality. Um, those are all really great ways to have people participate and respond. Um, if you want people to respond via voice, um, sometimes it can be a challenge because people have audio lag and you end up with three different people trying to talk at once because of a lag, no one was able to speaking. So if you want people to respond out loud or to give them the opportunity to respond out loud, um, use the hand raise functionality in Zoom or whatever tool you use. And that way you can know, okay, so, you know, Devin has a comment to make um, and then you can say, Devin, um, if you want to unmute yourself, you can make it. And then when they respond, you can then say, okay, the next person who raised their hand was um, Brian. Um, and you can just kind of go down the list in the order they raise their hand. And that way everyone has the opportunity to respond, um, but also there's kind of an order to it. And um, you don't end up with one of those situations where um, three different people are trying to type at once or trying one, to speak at once. One thing that I would add to with participation over Zoom or in an online class is um, well, we're hosting a webinar next week with um, a person who primarily uses ASL to communicate. And so I found out through them that you can request an ASL interpreter for certain events. And so in your library, if you're doing any sort of programming in person or um, online, and you know that some patrons in your library um, communicate primarily through ASL, um, American Sign Language, uh, then reaching out to a statewide department or division of services for the deaf might be a good um, option as well. Absolutely, thank you for adding that. And if you do have someone doing American Sign Language like through Zoom, make sure you pin their video so they are always visible to anyone who needs, who needs them. All right, so everyone still with me so far? Again, I promise at the end there will be time for um, question and answer at the end. Do you want to just make sure audio is still working and no major questions or concerns so far? All right, great. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time now talking about specific tools and ensuring that when you're developing content, um, that it is accessible. So my screen that I'm sharing, um, I use PowerPoint to make this. And when you're developing content, whether it's a slideshow or a handout, uh, you do really want to make sure you take accessibility into consideration. Um, and so when designing like a PowerPoint, um, make sure you choose a font that is very legible. Um, I don't have much in terms of specific recommendations. Um, most basic fonts will do. Um, avoid the ones that are more like a cursive font or more heavily stylized. Just choose a very simple, basic font that is um, easy to read. Um, this one, this presentation is using a font called Century Gothic, um, but the default in PowerPoint is uh, Calibri, I think. Um, Microsoft or the Google Docs and Google Slides, I think default Arial. Um, most default fonts will be totally great. Um, but also make sure when you're designing content that the font is large enough to be readable. And again, think about your space where you're presenting and make sure that it's readable from um, across, across the room, smaller screens. If you're able, share out your slides in advance. Uh, when you're doing a presentation like via Zoom, for example, uh, the screen reader may not be able to read the content that I'm sharing, but if uh, participants have these slides in advance, they can have them up while you're going and have them plugged into any assistive tools that they have. Um, 
You may not always have a full list of participants or their emails. So this may not always be possible, but have them available, have handouts available if you can for a class, uh, just so there are multiple, multiple options for access. And one of the coolest things about PowerPoint, and this also goes for Microsoft Word, other Microsoft documents, is they have a built-in accessibility checker. Um, which I'll show off very briefly here. So I'm gonna close my slideshow view here. Uh, everyone's seeing kind of the main PowerPoint interface now. Um, excellent. All right, so if I can get the Zoom bar to go away. Um, so in PowerPoint, if you select the tab that says review, there is a button that says check accessibility. And that will run an accessibility check on the content in your slides. And so we'll see that when Diaz um, does this, I um, very deliberately, when I was doing this, I did not put alt, alternate text um, for the image on my second slide. Um, so when you're developing um, slides or presentations, when you're using images, you want to make sure you include alternative text um, to just briefly describe what that image is. Um, so when you run the accessibility checker in Microsoft PowerPoint, it's gonna tell you why you should fix the content, but also give you steps to fix the content. So if I want to add alternative text to my image, I can just right click the object, which is gonna be the image in this case, and select edit alt text. And it's gonna just prompt me to describe this object in its context to someone who is blind. So I'll put very simply a photo of librarian Garrison Libby. And then once I've made that um, adjustment, the accessibility checker is gonna say, great, no accessibility issues found people with disabilities should not have difficulty reading this presentation. So it's a really helpful tool, uh, a really great way to uh, make sure that your material is accessible, um, especially if you use lots of text boxes, it will check on those um, and tell you in what order it'll say that it'll read them in or suggest that you manually input the order in which the screen reader should read them. Uh, so it's a really powerful tool. Uh, Microsoft Word has a very similar functionality. Um, to my knowledge, Google Docs, Google Slides don't have the same kind of in-depth accessibility checker. Um, they do at least have options for accessibility. Um, one thing that the built-in checker in PowerPoint does not do is it does not check check color contrast. And what that means is color contrast is basically, um, it's the contrast or it's a ratio of the contrast between colors uh, on the background and the foreground. Um, so I'm not super well versed in color theory, but in general, what it means is if you have a light background, you want darker color text, and if you have a light background, you're going to want to have darker colored text. I think I said that the right way most times. Um, but basically, you want to match dark with bright. And rather than try to memorize what colors do and don't go well together, um, I would recommend using some great um, color contrast checkers. Um, there, are, there is one link at the end of this presentation and you can tell it what colors you're using, and it will tell you whether or not they meet the minimum recommended guidelines. Um, something to be aware of is that um, just because something meets the minimum color contrast guidelines does not always mean that's going to be the best color combination. Um, I printed out um, these slides for myself uh, using black and white ink. And um, when I did that, um, printing in black and white, um, my second little color option here did not show up very well. 
So you also do want to be aware of the colors you're using and how they might show up if people are not printing in color, if they are printing things out. Um, so be aware of your color choices and check them with a the color contrast checker, but also think about how they may appear uh, if they're being printed in black and white or if colors are being tweaked. There are, of course, other presentation tools that are available. Um, Prezi and Canva are popular alternatives that people use to design uh, presentation tools um, that can make things that are a little bit more visually interesting. Um, but you do want to be careful because other tools don't always have the same level of accessibility options built into them. And so when I'm working with a new tool or if I'm trying a new tool, I just try to do a, a very basic search. Usually it's just like, I will Google Prezi accessibility, Canva accessibility, or whatever the tool is. Um, ideally, the tool itself, somewhere in their documentation on their support pages, they will have information about what the tool already does in the back end to ensure that the material is accessible, but also um, things you can do as you're developing content to make sure you are meeting accessibility requirements. If you do a search for accessibility options and you aren't finding um, many pages that provide help on how to do that, that might be a reason to look into alternative tools that have better support for accessibility. Because you really, again, want to be designing your tool from the outset with accessibility in mind. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and that goes for any kind of tool that you use. Uh, web design, it's very important to think about accessibility. Um, this too is an area where I know we as librarians don't always have total control over the content of our website or how, it, how it's designed, how it looks. Um, sometimes it's kind of controlled by our larger umbrella, the college where we work, our local government, um, wherever it is. Um, but it is worth running your website or any websites you have um, through a web accessibility checker. Uh, I've got one link at um, the end of this presentation. Um, to look for things that are inaccessible on your website and having conversations with the uh, people who are in charge of your web design and asking about what they've done to build in accessibility. And um, if you see problems when you've used an accessibility checker to um, work to rectify them. Um, Web accessibility is a very deep topic. We could spend an entire hour just on that. Um, but in general, I would say it's worth talking to your web designers about your website and using accessibility checkers um, to make sure your content is accessible. Uh, this goes for LibGuides as well. And you know, that's a very popular platform that we as librarians use to develop content. Um, and the good thing is LibGuides and Springshare does do a lot of work to um, have accessibility built in, but sometimes you do have to deal with extra work to make sure that things are properly um, accessible. Um, and there are a ton of great tools available to help you with that, um, with LibGuides, you know, general website stuff. And um, I've got a really good resource linked at the end of the presentation. Um, to help you with web accessibility. Um, PDFs um, can be very tricky things. Uh, they don't always play nicely with screen readers, especially if you take a document and just scan it with a scanner. As a PDF, um, it may not play well. So be careful with PDFs. Um, if you have the full version of Adobe Acrobat, um, it does have an accessibility checker button that you can use. They can help you flag things and then begin to fix them. But I always recommend uh, 
try to develop things using Google Docs or Microsoft Word or PowerPoint or Google Slides or whatever first, and then have that accessibility built in and then export it as a PDF. Because um, when it's done that way, it should preserve um, those accessibility options. But then you also have it in a different format where it can be shared um, for individuals who might need more customizable content. Um, that way, they, if you have the content available as a Microsoft Word document instead, um, they can have that and um, edit the text, edit the style they need to, edit colors, edit the size of the font to make sure that it is accessible to them. Um, and if you make videos, um, just make sure that you have them captioned um, and don't just rely on automated captioning, but then go in and tweak those captions to make sure they are accurate. Um, and generally, um, most screen recording tools and tools like YouTube have support for automated captioning. And then editing them is a very simple process of just going in and tweaking words. So make sure your content is, um, your captions are there and are, um, are accurate. Um, just another quick question. Um, how often do you review and update, update any instructional materials that you use? Do you review them regularly? Do you update them regularly? Or do you tend to just have ones you've had for a while and um, keep them as is for a while? And again, you can respond in the chat. So I would encourage you to make sure that you update your material often, you review your material often, um, ensure that it does remain, um, that it is following current accessibility guidelines. Um, and as, you, as you make edits, as you change them, um, make sure they are remaining accessible. Um, it, is, it is worth um, trying to build in time, you know, every semester, every year to go through material that you kind of reuse frequently. Um, make sure the material is still current, up to date. The way you describe things is current, up to date. And um, that way it's still relevant, but also um, still accessible to all, all people who use it. And again, think about the format to make it available in. Um, can it be made available in multiple formats? Um, so everyone can do it in the way that is um, best for them. The last thing I do want to talk about today is um, what's called universal design. And universal design is basically just an approach to thinking about instruction, thinking about learning, um, and thinking about doing it in a way that puts accessibility um, front and center. And in doing so, you're creating stronger sessions, not just for patrons who have disabilities, but making your session, your material um, stronger for all participants, no matter their ability. And in a nutshell, what universal design says is that you want to provide multiple means of engagement, representation, and actions in the content that you're developing. And just to briefly talk about what those three things mean, when we say multiple means of engagement, that means multiple options for helping participants build motivation and engagement in their learning. Um, you want to make sure your sessions are relevant to them, but you're also providing opportunities for um, your participants to have some kind of active involvement in the session, answering questions, responding to discussions, taking some ownership of the content, um, and trying to find ways that it can be relevant to themselves and their own lived experiences. We say multiple options for representation. What we mean is multiple modes of depicting and sharing content. 
So for this presentation, uh, I've been speaking um, for the past um, 40 some minutes, um, but I also have had content in a PowerPoint here, which is hopefully reinforcing what I'm saying and having content that can be customizable um, to the needs and the abilities of the user. Uh, so having that PowerPoint shared out in advance so that you could take it and you could adjust the fonts into um, and make sure that it, the material is available and legible to you. And when we say multiple modes of action, again, that basically just means um, multiple options for responding to the content. Um, so different ways to respond to questions, having chat, having people able to respond out loud with questions, um, but also providing um, opportunities for um, ensuring that people can use the technology that they need to succeed. Um, they, they can use that technology in the sessions. Um, so they have the ability to use assistive technology. There are outlets available. Um, so it's just a framework for approaching the way you design your content um, that can really help um, emphasize some of the things we've talked about right now um, over these past 50 minutes. Um, and so it's worth, if you want to dive deeper into accessibility, um, approaching it from a universal design framework is a really great way to go about it. And um, I have a good link to some more in-depth information about that end of this presentation. So as we are wrapping up, um, one last thing before I allow time for y'all to share any questions you have. Um, I would love to hear um, what have you done on your end um, that maybe I haven't talked about today to make instruction more accessible, or what are additional tips that you have uh, for your peers today and for me and for anyone um, to build more accessible content for presentations, for instruction, um, and for things like that. What, what tips do you have? Ah, uh, we have a suggestion. Should my video as well. Sorry about that. So we have a suggestion that was messaged to me directly. Uh, action should be action and reflection. Reflection on learning is so important with the end user, um, with our teaching. I liked the review options for the software tip that Garrison shared. Excellent. Yeah, I think the reflection piece is really um, important. Um, let's see what other folks are saying. Um, Yes, trying to select materials that feature the stories and perspectives from the user community in the classroom event. It's great. Um, someone said, as um, someone with a speech impediment is exaggerated public speaking, having a way to ask questions without having to talk in front of everyone. Easier? Absolutely. Um, just knowing who the audience is, um, wonderful tip. Um, again, you can try to ask in advance when people sign up or ask an instructor if there are accommodations. Um, so emailing yeah. each student, their library card number, information is really great. Mm -hmm. um, trying not to find information, too much information on one slide. Um, I am certainly very guilty of having tons of text on PowerPoints. Um, but yes, trying to have slides simple and not a ton of text is a really great, um, really great tip. Um, a lot of webinars from our consortium lately have asked people to turn on their video if they're able, people who are speaking to turn on their video if they're able to, um, to help those who read my lips. Um, making sure your forms, um, your sign up forms, ask for accommodations. Um, normalize asking peers for help if you get lost. Um, Really great tip as well. Um, so yes, excellent. So really excellent tips. Um, a lot of excellent things you can do. And again, I think none of these um, none of these are very challenging or very radical. But it's really just about taking the time when you're designing sessions to think through some of these things 
and to build in some of those factors as you design a class, a presentation, a workshop, um, and make sure that accessibility is something that you are really thinking about and thinking about the potential needs of all the participants in your session. Oh, I um, really like the suggestion, um, requesting feedback via email and giving my email address, asking to answer one thing you learned one thing you wish you learned, which helps respond to questions that didn't get answered. And the added advantage is they have a person contact uh, to return to even after the session for other research projects. Um, and then we have providing video link information tags so that students can plan their time, make informed choices before setting aside time. Sometimes uh, realize it's a very short video. And then Daisy sharing, I have found that making presentations more participatory seems to increase engagement. I struggle with maintaining focus. So I have found personally that breaking up a presentation with participation elements usually helps keep me engaged. Um, Anita sharing in my library email, I include a link to project outcome. After the session, I ask the students um, to click on that link and take the survey before leaving class. Yeah, and project outcome is a tool that is both for academic libraries and public libraries in measuring engagement. Um, one thing as well is, I don't know if you all have experienced this, but when I was first taught what active learning is and how to do it in a classroom, it was very much based on people physically moving around the room. And if they're moving around, that means they're learning. But in reality, some people can't do that successfully in a classroom, and that requires a lot more accommodations than just simply what we, you know, what I was taught uh, was active learning. And so I think a lot of the last several years has been unlearning that expectation that people need to be moving around. Maybe they can be participating by reflecting, as people suggested, taking time to record what they learned, setting goals, or uh, responding via Mentimeter or a poll or something like that. Maybe that's participation and not necessarily moving around the physical space of the classroom or um, the meeting room. Yes, that's an excellent point. You know, active learning is so important, but active can mean a lot of different things. It doesn't have to be physically moving around um, and physically like doing things. It can also mean different ways of active participation, which can be electronic and reflection in the things. As we wrap up, um, I do just have a few additional links um, here to share. Um, the Library Accessibility Alliance is a really great group that advocates for accessibility in libraries. It also has some great resources on making your libraries and the work that you do more accessible. Um, Web AIM, is um, a great tool for um, ensuring any of your web content is accessible. They've got some really great trainings and some great checkers and some great tips to help you um, have a specific accessibility checker that you can run your website through, see if there are any issues there. Uh, if you want to learn more about universal design for learning, there's a great link there. And also just a really helpful accessible event checklist that can help give you some things to think about as you plan for events, um, namely in-person events um, in your library space. Um, I know we're kind of coming up on time here, but if you do have any questions, um, you can feel free to share them in the chat, or if you'd like, you can use the uh, raise hand function in Zoom, and then we can call on you to speak out loud. If you do have questions, um, please feel free to voice them. Um, and um, you can also email me at um, garrison.libby at cpcc.edu um, if you would like, uh, if you want to just ask questions there. Um, otherwise, if you have questions, um, please let me know. I'm happy to answer as best I can. And thank you, Devin, for sharing that link in the chat. Yeah, I definitely recommend checking out that checklist um, for planning in-person events. And also the UDL guidelines website has so many graphic organizers um, and tools and key questions to keep in mind when planning lessons. 
Um, I was browsing that before the session and it's chock full of resources. Thank you all so, so much. Um, again, I'll stick around for a few more minutes if you have questions, but also feel free to email me after the fact. I'm always happy to talk further. Um, but I really appreciate all of you taking the time to um, join this afternoon. Um, I hope it was helpful. And um, you know, again, I think this is not, it's not hard. It's not, it's not entirely challenging. It's just about thinking about it and um, really doing the having that intentional planning to load it into the, that, um, that we all do. Thank you so much, Garrison, for taking the time today um, to share all these tools and resources and things to keep in mind. Um, folks, I will include this email address um, in the email, the follow-up email that I'll send today with the survey, a recording with captions, um, and the presentation slides themselves. Um, if you have any questions after the webinar for me as well, feel free to email me, devin at nclive.org. Or if you have any suggestions for future accessibility training topics um, for us to cover, I'd love to hear those suggestions as well. All right. I'm sharing my screen here.